Let's try and put into math language what the first law says. And then we'll do the same thing to accommodate the second law. So the first thing is a very simple equation. It just says that total universal energy is equal to the sum of all the kinds of energy in the universe at any given moment. You obviously can add some of the other kinds of energy that are not on this list. Or, to make it very simple, the total amount of energy in the universe is simply the sum of all of the energy that is useful and all of the energy that is entropic or useless in the universe at any given moment. Let me say a, a word or two about universal energy and its constancy. To say it is constant means that the change in universal energy over time has got to equal zero. So this is another mathematical statement or construct that, that says the first law. It says that the change in universal energy is equal to zero. In other words, universal energy does not change. It's neither created nor is it destroyed. The Greek letter delta means change in, so when you see it in front of some term, it means change in that term. Well, we can also say then that the sum of the change in useful energy and the change in useless energy must also equal zero. That comes from the second equation near the top of this slide. If we do that, then we can solve for the change in useful energy energy. And that's shown in green right here. The change in useful energy is equal to minus the change in useless energy. This statement conforms to both the first and the second law of thermodynamics. And what is interesting about it is that it establishes or states a reciprocal relationship between the two quantities. Graphed this way, useful energy is always declining and useless energy is always increasing reciprocally. I've given you a graph and I've given you an equation, but you know you can't really measure real numbers in universal terms. What you can do is measure the exchange of energy between isolated or closed systems within the universe. And we do this all the time. To do this, let's define a few terms. Let delta E, let the change in useful energy equal delta G. This was first done by a man named Gibbs, so G is the Gibbs free energy. And let the change in useless energy or the change in entropy equal delta S. Now, let's take a system that's easy to understand and watch how energy change affects the system. We're going to define the system as a pot of water, just a pot of water. It's an isolated system, i.e. a closed system, and we imagine that it has a finite internal energy content called E. Now, I admit that you can't know what the number is for E. We don't know what the number is for the internal energy of that pot of water. But we can write this equation. Whatever it is, it's equal to the sum of the internal free energy and internal entropy of this pot of water. So we can write E equals G plus S. So far so good. I still can't assign numbers to either E, G, or S. But we're about to assign numbers, or get to the point where we can. Now if we put energy into the pot, say to heat it, we know that the internal energy of the pot will change. How do we know that? I can put a thermometer into the water and I can watch as I heat the water that the temperature goes up. As you probably know, for every increase of one degree of a, of a milliliter of water, the water has absorbed one calorie. So the definition of a calorie is the amount of energy absorbed by a milliliter of water as it rises one degree Celsius. So if we say Q is the energy used to heat the pot, we can say that Q is equal to, or will be reflected as, a change in the internal energy. Or we can say that it's simply equal to the change in free energy plus the change in entropy. So Q is the energy put into a system, the pot of water. By the way, it could also be the energy lost by the system, say when you turn the fire off and the pot of water simply cools down. And delta E, delta G, and delta S are the changes in internal energy, free energy, and entropy of the system respectively. So here's that equation again, Q equals delta G plus delta S. This is beginning to look a bit like the equation we're trying to derive, so we're headed in the right direction. Now if we define Q as delta H or enthalpy change, we can write an equation that looks even more like the one we're trying to get at. That's delta H equals delta G plus delta S. So now we have to tell you what delta H is. It is the change in equivalent heat content, uh, that is to say the energy moving in or out of the system, but measured in calories. What is that all about? Well, I could have heated the water not with calories of heat, but I could have heated it by, for example, taking two electrical wires that come from a, a, a plug that's plugged in the wall and holding the wires to that pot. As you can imagine, the pot is going to get hot. First you're going to see sparks, and then of course the pot itself will get very warm, and that heat in the metal of the pot is going to be transmitted to the water, and the water molecules will start to move, and that's what is in fact going to be the increase in temperature of the water in the pot. Well, 
Electrical energy is measured in volts, but there's an equation that converts volts to calories. So I can tell you how much energy I have put into the pot of water by holding the electrodes there. But I can tell it to you in calories or in volts. So if I choose to tell it to you in calories, I can tell you the delta H, that is the increase in heat content of that pot. Chemically, enthalpy change is simply the sum of bond energy gains and losses that occur when you make and break bonds in a chemical reaction. But if you go back to your chemistry textbook, you will see a list of bond energies. So for example, I don't remember anymore, but a carbon-carbon bond might uh, have a bond energy of, of say 90 calories per mole or something like that. And you can look that sort of thing up. But that's what an enthalpy change would be for an actual chemical reaction. Well, from the third law of thermodynamics, that's one that says that entropy actually depends on temperature. What it says officially is that entropy is going to be at its lowest as you approach absolute zero, zero degrees Kelvin. Well, since entropy is dependent on temperature, we have to factor temperature in when we look at energy changes, and so we have. So now the formula has become delta H equals delta G plus T delta S, where T is the absolute temperature in degrees Kelvin. Finally, we have the equation that I showed you up front that I said we wanted to try and derive by considering the laws of thermodynamics and how they apply to living systems and non-living systems.